Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. It's great to be back with you. Um, the title of our talk today is, I've called it The Permanence of Ancient Egypt. In your, in your program that they, you get overnight, it said Mysteries of Ancient Egypt. And I realized that I put mystery in like half the titles of my talks, so I decided to change this. The point of this particular title is I want to talk a little bit today generally about ancient Egypt, give you a background, as you will recall from, was that like six months ago? I told you I am not an Egyptologist. We had Egyptologists on the last cruise. But I have studied Egypt uh, quite a lot in terms especially of their religious um, uh, systems, their beliefs, their gods, that sort of thing. And so uh, since I am here without an Egyptologist on this trip, I've uh, put together in this first talk a general overview about ancient Egypt, the, uh, the nature of their history, some of the particular ways in which this culture has fascinated of the entire world and uh, the fact that they have the longest continuous history of any nation on the planet. So we'll talk about some of those things today and then tomorrow our talk will be pharaohs, temples and tombs and tomorrow afternoon and I will give you some more specific information about what we will be experiencing when we go to Luxor. Uh, the Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, remember Ava, the, our ship photographer, will be working, uh, will be talking with us about icons, how they're made, the importance of them, that sort of thing. So make sure you come at 10 tomorrow for her talk, and then at 4 tomorrow we will do our Pharaoh's Temples and Tombs. I'll continue to show you this, bring a pen, um, write it down if you're interested, both the videos of these lectures. There are also videos from previous Windstar trips and over 200 hours worth of lectures I've done on other topics. So if you're interested, that will be available, plus all the PowerPoints are there. It's free of charge. All you gotta do is go onto this website and the bar that goes across it, there's a tab that says Windstar Talks and you'll get these videos once we get home and have a chance to process those. All right, there is, as I suggested, no culture in history that has been, uh, caused as much fascination with people everywhere on the planet. Since the time of ancient Greece, we have writings of people that have just been astonished with Egypt. The, and these are some of the reasons why. Of course, the Mask of Tutankhamun. Um, you'll see this location, by the way. This is the Mortuary Temple of Hatshepsut and uh, various other kinds of art. The uh, Pyramid and the Sphinx, which again, I'm sorry you won't see the Pyramid and the Sphinx on this particular trip, but what you see is gonna be more spectacular than that. Egypt has always been fascinating to people because as an ancient culture, it started about 3600 BC, so it's been around for almost 5,000 years, and for over 3,000 years of that, it was one continuous culture. Egypt, ancient Egypt, was, was responsible for developing not only extraordinary architecture and art, they developed a system of mathematics, a system of medicine, which was for its time quite effective. <clears throat> Irrigation and agricultural production were very advanced there. The very first known ships in the world were built by the Egyptians. They, de they developed glass and other ways of glazing materials uh, to create beauty. So whether you think of Egypt as pyramids and sphinxes, or mummies and tombs, or golden burial masks, uh, the, the Greeks talked about the Egyptians and their animal-headed gods, and how fascinating that was. Um, Herodotus, the founder of modern history, uh, talked about the fact that the Egyptians seemed to be the most religious people that had ever existed. So with almost, um, with about 3,000 years of continuous history, <laughs> many, many other empires have come and gone during the time that Egypt has existed. We talked about the Mesopotamian Valley and the fact that this part of the Middle East, the Levant, has seen one empire after another. You know, the, the uh, Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Romans, the Greeks, Alexander, back and forth and on and on. In almost every case, when an empire would change, the new empire would create their own stamp. They would turn whoever it was they conquered into their cultural type. In Egypt, they have been significantly protected from conquest, and when they were conquered, in almost every case, the conquerors, instead of making the Egyptians like them, they became like the Egyptians. Like the Ptolemaic period, after Alexander the Great, his general Ptolemy took over Egypt, and yet 
Ptolemy's descendants came down to the last of the Ptolemaic leaders was Cleopatra. And you don't get much more Egyptian than Cleopatra. So the Ptolemies did not enforce Greek culture, as one example, on the Egyptians, but rather the other way around. They adopted the Egyptian model. Now there's a major reason why Egypt has not been conquered, or you know, was not conquered in ancient times very much, and that is the geography of Egypt. We looked at the fact that the Mesopotamian Valley, the Levant, most of it is open. People could come in from every side, march in with their armies, and, and conquer. <clears throat> well, in the case of Egypt, all of Egypt follows the Nile River in terms of the population. More than 80% of Egypt cannot be populated because it's desert. What that meant is that Egypt, as it existed along the Nile River, had the protection on the west and on the south by the Sahara, the Great Desert. On the east, they were protected by the Red Sea, and beyond that, the Arabian Desert and the Desert of the Sinai Peninsula. There was only one way that other cultures, other empires, other conquerors could really approach Egypt, and that was from the sea. A very narrow approach as they would approach from the sea and then follow the Nile River down. The only exception to that was from, there were a couple of times in which the Nubians, people from the south, further up the river, the Nile River would uh, approach and there's one whole period of dynasties in which Egypt was conquered by the Nubians from uh, farther south in Africa. So this protection meant very few people could approach them. If they did, they approached on a very narrow front at the, uh, the mouth of the river. Now, Egypt, the river of Nile flows from the south to the north. We're not used to that. We're used to rivers that flow the other direction, right? The Mississippi, north to south. Well, because of the fact that Egypt is built on a river that flows from the south to the north, the, uh, the southern part is called Upper Egypt. The northern part is called Lower Egypt. I'll talk about that in a minute. Just so you know, as I use those expressions, Upper Egypt is further south because that's the, the, where the river starts. Lower Egypt is around the Nile Delta. This Nile River, in fact, Herodotus, in the 5th century BC, the founder of modern history as we understand it, the Greek historian, was uh, quoted as saying, Egypt is the gift of the Nile. Without the Nile River, the Egyptian culture would not have developed. It simply couldn't have existed without this fertile river valley. Almost all of the ancient cultures were oriented around some river and the fertility, the irrigation that was possible, the richer soil that made agriculture possible. And in particular, the Nile created the Egyptian culture because the Nile had a peculiar habit. Once a year, it would flood, and it would flood very predictably. That flooding brought alluvial soil, a quality soil, good growing soil, down from the mountains and spread it out so that not only did you have a river, but you had very rich, fertile <coughs> soil all around it. Every year, the river would rise, and on good years, it would rise slowly and then go back down slowly. Bad years, they had flooding. Or there were a few years in the history when they suffered because it didn't flood at all. Because of this uh, flooding and then receding of the river every year, several things happened. One, the Egyptians developed the idea of two different kinds of land. The Kemet was the black land of the river basin. That was the rich soil that you could grow things in. They then also referred to the Deshret, the red land, which was the desert on either side of the Nile, the land that you could not live in. Now they did acquire minerals and things from there. They did develop the ability to cross over, especially like to the Red Sea from the Nile. But for the most part, they developed this idea that the good land, the blessed land, the Kemet, was the black land. The rest of it was, uh, they associated with chaos. In fact, their gods lined up like that. Tomorrow, we're going to start out talking about some of the deities and some of the religious beliefs of, of Egypt, because we're going to be seeing temples in Luxor. And the god of the desert, Set, was also the god of chaos. It gives you an idea of uh, what their feeling was about the desert, whereas one of their favorite gods, Happy, just happens to be, it's H-A-P-I, was the god of the Nile. The Nile has had its own deity. 
Well, the actually happy was the god of the the inundation of the Nile, the, you know, the uh, growing of the Nile and then the receding. This idea that every year the Nile would flood and it would bring good soil and then it would go back down again created this, they had a basic life that was built on this cycle. There was a time of renewal and renovation of the soil and then it would recede. And this idea that every year there would be this life-giving life increase in the river that would then recede gave them an idea there always is going to be a return of life. There's always going to be a cycle in which there are blessings that come. This was the foundational idea behind the Egyptian belief that, that people would live forever. That yes, you would die, you would sort of recede from this life, but then you would return. There would be an afterlife. This is what led to pyramids and tombs. It's what led to their uh, process of mummy mummification. They preserved the body because they expected that they would re-inhabit that body later on in the same way that the river came every year and brought life again and then receded. So everything about their ancient culture was based upon this idea of the river uh, bringing life, receding, and then cycling back again. Now in its early history, uh, you'll notice all these little red lines there. I don't expect you to be able to read that. But in ancient Egypt, before the time of the dynasties, there are 31 dynasties or uh, kingly families that have been identified as ruling over the 3,000 plus year history of Egypt. Prior to that, each section of the Nile River was ruled by a local governor. Each of those little sections in between these red lines right here, each of them had their own governor, their own ruler. Those different sections of land along the Nile, and again, that's, that's as far as the line had to go because there was nothing beyond that. Each of those little sections of the river were a separate governed uh, province. Those were called gnomes, like the city in Alaska, N-O-M-E, N-O-M-E, gnome. And the rulers of each of those in ancient pre-dynastic uh, Egypt were called nomarchs. Nomarchs, it's sort of like monarchs spelled sideways. So <laughs> nomarchs, they were the rulers of each of these different sections. Well, over a period of time, they slowly began to realize that these, var these various nomarchs realized, well, you know, if I can develop a partnership with the nomarch just north of me or just south of me along the river, we can work together and be more efficient. So they started bonding together and developing these larger groups. But the one place they sort of divided was right around um, the Amarna the, along here, the upper Egypt, which was south, and the lower Egypt, which was the Nile Delta and then the, some, a number of the gnomes uh, close to that, they gathered together into sort of two parties. There was the upper Egypt and lower Egypt, and they started fighting each other. And there were periods of warfare between upper and lower Egypt. The critical time for the history of Egypt was when upper and lower Egypt were joined together in one. This is when the history of Egypt as we know it really begins. And this is important because uh, I'm going to show you some images to look for. When you are in Luxor, you will see all sorts of symbols which represent the unifying of Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt into one. In fact, as you see, Lower Egypt here, Upper Egypt here, there's some disagreement among scholars as to where it actually divided. Some people think it actually was just the Nile Delta here. Some believe that it was uh, along the Amarna area, which is sort of parallel to the end of the Sinai Peninsula here. Uh, from my reading and study, I believe this makes more sense, that this was Lower Egypt, all of the rest of it was Upper Egypt. I mentioned to you the other day that each of those two areas had their own ruler. The gnomes had gotten together in Upper Egypt, the gnomes had gotten together in Lower Egypt, and they were fighting each other. In Upper Egypt, that is, further south, the crown was the white crown of Upper Egypt. And this crown um, was, was it had a name, they specifically referred to it as the Hejet. The Hejet was the white crown of Upper Egypt. The red crown, or the Deshret, was the crown of Lower Egypt. When they finally had one ruler who was able to conquer both of them, he created a unifying crown, which was called the Pshent. The Pshent was the dual crown. It was both the white crown of Upper Egypt and the red crown of Lower Egypt you will see all three of those symbols on the walls at Luxor and Karnak. And particularly, you will see the white crown and the red crown being worn and joining each other. And it's actually the same ruler wearing both. And you will see places where the, the two crowns are worn together. 
In fact, you will see a number, because this is so important, this joining together of the two upper and lower Egypt is the critical history. And in fact, the pharaohs were recognized as the ruler of two lands. That was one of their most important titles. When you get to Luxor, you will see things like this, where you have a figure wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt, one wearing the red crown of Lower Egypt, and providing the dual crown to the pharaoh. You also will see a number of things like these two. And it looks like two figures tying something up. That's exactly what it is. If you look closely, you'll notice that plant here and that plant are not the same. This is a papyrus plant. This is a lotus plant. The lotus plant was the symbol of Upper Egypt. The papyrus plant was the symbol of Lower Egypt. The same thing is true here. This plant and this plant are not the same. Binding together these two symbols of Upper and Lower Egypt was a critical sign of them being one kingdom. And it was that unity that gave them their power, their authority. And so you'll see these symbols of figures tying together the Upper and Lower Egypt. It's also true that Upper Egypt had as their primary god the, vul uh, the vulture goddess. Lower Egypt had as their primary god the cobra. This is the mask of Tutankhamun. If you've ever looked at it closely, it has both a vulture and a cobra on it because that's the symbol of the unifying of the Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. Now, this is a timeline of Egyptian history. I'll give you five minutes to memorize this, and then we'll have a test. No, we won't do that. The easiest way to understand the history of ancient Egypt is to think about three kingdoms and then the periods that surrounded them. There was the Old Kingdom. This is the kingdom that produced the pyramids and the Sphinx up near modern Cairo in Giza. Uh, back in the days when it had not yet occurred to them that if they have this big showy place where rich people were buried, somebody's going to come and steal their stuff. That's why later on, not in the Old Kingdom, but in the New Kingdom, they started burying pharaohs in secret tombs. So people, it wasn't so obvious where they were, so that thieves would come and steal the things that were left with them. So the Old Kingdom lasted about 505 years. There was a pre-dynastic period, the early dynastic period before that. But then the, uh, Egypt really started with the unification of the Old Kingdom. We then had the Middle Kingdom, which lasted about 405 years, and then the New Kingdom. The things that we're going to see on this trip are New Kingdom monuments. Um, that's where most of the people you will have heard of came from. Ramesses II was part of the New Kingdom. Um, uh, the, the great kings, Thutmose the Third, and others. But in between and after each of these kingdoms, there were what were called intermediate periods, in which the simple definition is that the intermediate periods were the times when there was not one king over, over all of Egypt. It had split up, there were multiple kings, or there was an influx of foreigners in a couple of instances, and they had taken over, either from Nubia in the south or the Hyksos, who came in, they were uh, Semitic people from Canaan, that came in and took over for a while until one pharaoh could again get control. So you had the pre-dynastic period, then the Old Kingdom, the dynasties of pharaohs, then an intermediate period where they weren't, didn't have one king, then they got it together again in the Middle Kingdom, then they had a breakdown again, and then the New Kingdom, and finally the third intermediate period, which lasted over 400 years, in which things really fell apart. Before, after that, they are taken over by the Persian Achaemenid uh, dynasty. Then Alexander the Great comes roaring through, and after him, he, one of his generals, Ptolemy, takes over Egypt. That's the Ptolemaic period. As I mentioned, Cleopatra was a Ptolemy. Then you have the Romans coming in, Roman and Byzantine period, the Arab and Muslim periods, and then the Ottoman Empire. That's the whole history of Egypt. But the important part for our consideration is from the early dynastic Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom, and then the intermediate periods around those. I want to talk about that a little bit as we go along. By the way, if I ever say something and somebody's really lost, you know, feel free to throw a shoe at me or yell or whatever if I need to answer something right now and, and not wait till the end. I'm happy to do that. The unification of the Upper and Lower Egypt, of the two lands into one, is primarily uh, identified as having happened under a man named Narmer. Narmer literally means angry catfish. What? All of the ancient rulers would have some sort of strong name, and they thought a catfish was a really strong animal, so angry catfish, Narmer, 
was the one who unified Upper and Lower Egypt. He is identified in some of the histories by the name Menes, M-E-N-E-S. We believe, scholars believe Menes and Narmer, two different names that are used in different places, were the same person. The first and second dynasties that start out are under Narmer. These are two images from two sides of what's called the palette of Narmer. Uh, you'll notice on one side he is wearing the crown of southern Egypt, or I'm sorry, of lower Egypt, and one side he's wearing the crown of northern Egypt. Now, you'll notice he's got his fist up like this. Um, this is actually the palette of Narmer. There's the image I showed, one of the images, here's the other one where he's wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt and the red crown of Lower Egypt. Here he is driving a spike into the head of one of his enemies. Yikes. Here he's marching along with his soldiers. See how much taller he is than everybody else? And these are all decapitated enemies. He obviously didn't just talk people into doing this when he combined the two kingdoms. He was a warrior king. And so by force of arms, he unified the two halves and in doing so, around 36, well, 3100 BC, he created the unified Egypt. Now, the first two dynasties are there. Narmer or Menes is considered the very first of the leaders of Egypt. After that pre-dynastic, that early dynastic period, the first two dynasties, and there are 31 total dynasties in the Egyptian history. The dynastic orders were divided up by a priest um, in the third century BC and it's believed that he probably put all this together to try to explain to the new Ptolemy rulers, the new, the new guys that had come in, the Greeks that came in that were running things, they were saying, help me understand this history. And so one of the priests put together this history and he broke all of Egypt up into 31 family dynasties who were rulers. The first two were the pre-dynastic periods, although those two dynasties are identified there, and then we pick up with the Old Kingdom. Those 31 dynasties don't exactly line up completely. There, it, uh, the seventh dynasty, it appears, was simultaneous to the eighth dynasty. The tenth dynasty may not have actually existed. It's a little confusing, but once all that got put in place, nobody could change it. But that's a way to understand there are a series of 31 dynasties down through the pre-dynastic, the old, middle, and new kingdoms, and then the intermediate periods. The Old Kingdom started around 2686. These are not exact dates, and they'll vary a little bit, because how do you tell when, when a dynasty actually ends? Sometimes there was just difficult times, famine, the government wasn't working well, these uh, invaders started coming in, well, it was when they first arrived or when they actually conquered. It's not exact. This is not an exact science. But the Old Kingdom, as I said, was the, they're the ones that invented pyramids. They're the ones that created the earliest great monuments that people associate. The, um, okay, I won't make any jokes. The, the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth dynasties were the dynasties of the Old Kingdom. It was at this time, once the, the followers, after Narmer, when the, the dynasties came along, Caffrey, Caffrey is the one that built the Great Pyramid at Giza. Several of these, um, like uh, Djoser was a pharaoh who first started building pyramids, but he built the stepped pyramids, the ones that aren't just straight-sided. He was the one that created the early pyramids in the, in the third dynasty, and then in the fourth dynasty, uh, uh, Khufu, Khafre, these guys were building the, the big pyramids that you see, all right? The Sphinx comes from that period as well. They advanced architecture, art, technology. They um, acquired land, they extended the area in which there was fertile land, they applied irrigation, they raised the level of education, they introduced the idea of having a, a priestly group of people who were well educated, of having scribes who were, uh, the scribes, the people who could write and keep records, were one of the highest levels in their society. They appreciated education. One of the problems, though, is they got so wrapped up in building these temples and the building these um, tombs, which were what the pyramids were, the pharaohs started giving so much money to the priests for new temples and giving so much money to mortuary cults, as they were called, people who were focused on taking care of the dead and perfecting mummification and all that, that they kind of bankrupted the, 
the pharaohs. They ended up running out of money, which is one of the reasons that they, they receded after the sixth dynasty. The first intermediate period, which followed the old kingdom, happened around the 2181 is the date we usually give for it. It, it lasted for about 125 years. And during that period of time, there was a general failure of the political system because the pharaohs went sort of bankrupt. There was environmental disaster. They had floods. They had uh, famine during that time. There was civil disorder. People were rebelling. And some of the nomarchs, these local rulers, they started pulling away from the authority of the central government. And the central government ended up collapsing. It collapsed for about 125 years. And, and various, you know, in the north, they had sort of set up their whole thing. In the south, they had their thing going. And then um, a pharaoh came along about 2055. And his name was Mintu Hotep II. He pulled them all back together and made it one. He reunited the northern and southern, the, up, the lower and upper Egypt, and he created the Middle Kingdom. This image right here is Amenemhat III. He was the last of the great pharaohs of the Middle Kingdom. But the Middle Kingdom, they got away from this idea of building these giant pyramids. They advanced general architecture. They refined the uh, religious study. They uh, advocated literature. In fact, it was during the Middle Period that they formalized the Egyptian language. And it became the formal Egyptian that continued for, for throughout the whole history of Egypt after that. They established great art. They reclaimed a lot of the land that had been lost because of devastating floods and famine. They uh, increased irrigation. They conquered south into Nubia, uh, the, the territory south in Africa from Egypt. And in doing so, they gained, there was a lot of gold mine down there. They gained a lot of wealth. It became a very important time. The Middle Kingdom is when they sort of stabilized everything, stopped being so flashy, and really created the basis for what we think of as the history of Egypt. They continued until... Um, from 2055 until about 1650, and we get then into the second intermediate period, which was really important. Um, Amenemhat III had given permission to a group of Semitic peoples from Canaan. Canaan is Palestine. We're talking about the area we know of as Israel. He gave them permission to come down and settle in the Delta area. Well, that was all great until things started going a little rough for the Middle Kingdom, and these, these people who were known as the Hyksos, the Hyksos, that word means foreign rulers. They rose up when the central government in Egypt got weak, and they took over. And they ruled Egypt, these foreign rulers. In fact, the word Hyksos means foreign ruler. They ruled all of Egypt for a period of time. That actually was a really good time for Egypt, because in the process, they introduced a lot of innovations. One of the important innovations that they introduced that had not existed in Egypt before was the chariot, the horse-drawn chariot. They introduced the composite bow, they introduced the scimitar and other kinds of uh, weaponry. They brought in a, an advanced use of metal, uh, metallurgy and uh, bronze and other materials. They created a new kind of pottery. These Hyksos, these foreign rulers, really advanced the Egyptian culture to a great extent during the period of time that they were there the second intermediate period. But they were foreign rulers, and the Egyptians were not happy about that. They actually claimed three different dynasties where foreigners, non-Egyptians, were ruling. That's the 15th, 16th, and 17th dynasties. It lasted about 100 years before they ended up being thrown out. And when they were thrown out, we move into the New Kingdom, around 1550 BC. The New Kingdom is the flashy one. That's the one that you usually, that's the Tutankhamun golden mask. That's the, the astonishing tombs and all the tomb paintings. Uh, here, you're going to be there. You're going to visit this. This is the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut was a female pharaoh. And we'll tell you that story a little bit tomorrow. Um, this is Tutankhamun, of course. This is an image of Amenhotep IV, who was renamed himself Akhenaten. He's the one that introduced monotheism for a period of time. He moved the capital from Thebes, which is what they used to call Luxor, where we're going to be. They had worshipped primarily Amun or Amun-Ra. They sometimes combined their deities. Again, we'll talk about that more specifically tomorrow. But Akhenaten, Amenhotep IV, was married to this woman, Nefertiti. This is one of the most uh, famous 
images from ancient Egypt. It is the bust of Nefertiti. So we are going to see all of the New Kingdom temple kinds of things. We won't get up to Amarna, but we'll see the things in Luxor. This I referred to this morning, Ramses II, or Ramses the Great, is one of the most famous of all of the pharaohs. He was a New Kingdom pharaoh. This is his temple in uh, Abu Simbel. When I talked about Petra, was that just this morning? When I talked about Petra and I told you that Burkhardt was the, the uh, Swiss explorer who found Petra after 500 years of it being lost to the West, it was that same guy who discovered this temple. This is south or further upriver from where we're going to be visiting, but this is part of the New Kingdom. This is a sculpture of Thutmose III, again one of the New Kingdom pharaohs. He's the one that I think was the pharaoh of the Exodus, not just me, there's other people who think that. Uh, but all of these kinds of images, all of this kind of artwork, the energy, the New Kingdom had more really superbly capable leaders, both male uh, pharaohs and in the case of Hatshepsut, wonderful queens, uh, female pharaohs, and they're the ones that really expanded Egypt. At one point they control, Egypt controlled land all the way up to northern Syria, you know, almost all the way up to Turkey as well as all the way down Nubia, down into what was called Punt at that time, and all the way over through Libya. The greatest area, the greatest, richest time for all of Egypt was during this New Kingdom. After the New Kingdom, there was another period of recession, the intermediate period, and then we get to what's called the Late Period. Interestingly, in the Late Period, the Nubians from down south, who were black African peoples, they came up and conquered Egypt, and so we had a period of time in which there were black, pharaoh, uh, black pharaohs. This hat, which is the sort of the double feathered hat, is the symbol of Amun. You're going to see a lot of carvings on the walls, and you'll see these, looks like two tower things on a hat. That's a symbol for the god Amun. And in this case, we have Taharqa, who is one of the Nubian kings. This is an image of him, a carved image of him. Um, the 25th dynasty was a Nubian dynasty in the late period. Um, again, you have images of black pharaohs since they were controlling that, and that continued, the late period continued up through the very last of the uh, pharaohic queens and leaders was Cleopatra. Cleopatra was part of the Ptolemaic or the Greek culture, but she was the last of the pharaohs. In, uh, throughout that whole process, um, we, after the Nubians, we had various other people. The Persians came in, they conquered. The Byzantines and Romans ruled for a period of time. So that's after the greatness of Egypt. But still, again, these Nubian people came in, and while they wore uh, some native gear, like the leopard skins, they wore the hats, they wore the symbols, they, uh, the artwork represented not the culture they had come from, but the culture they'd overtaken, the Egyptian culture. And so we'll see uh, some of those kinds of images when we are in Luxor. One of the things you're going to see a ton of, and trust me when I say you're going to see a lot of this, are Egyptian hieroglyphics. The word hieroglyphic, actually Egypt is not the only country that's had hieroglyphics. The term hieroglyphic means sacred writing or God's words, quite literally. And so this was used primarily by priests and scribes to represent the afterlife, to, um, to capture magical quotations. It was seen as a holy religious kind of thing. Hieroglyphics um, is one of the things that fascinates so many people. Emily Teeter, the Egyptologist that we had on last time, I asked her, you know, Emily, what caused you to, get, to become an Egyptologist? Why did you pursue this? And she said, hieroglyphics. As a child, I saw this stuff and I had to know what it said. I had to know what it meant. Well, hieroglyphics is, and it's very close, hieroglyphics is the second oldest written language that we have after ancient Sumerian. That's because Egypt is probably the second oldest culture that we have, and writing is considered one of the basic elements of any civilization. We believe that the oldest hieroglyphics started around 3200 BC and continued to be the writing form, although it developed some, the basic writing form continued for over 3500 years. Interestingly enough, after Cleopatra, which was 30 BC, that's when the Romans, you know, Cleopatra and Mark Anthony, and they lost, 
and uh, she committed suicide. She was the last of the great uh, rulers of Egypt. It's at that point when the Romans came in, they had no interest in pursuing this. That's when we lost the ability to read hieroglyphics. We didn't recover it again for almost 1800 years. But hieroglyphics, as I said, was used by priests, by royalty, by scribes and civil officials. This is not just anybody sitting in their living room, you know, at their kitchen table, chiseling these images out. Not everybody could read this stuff. Hieroglyphics is made of seven to 800 basic images or symbols, but the entire vocabulary of hieroglyphics includes almost 2,000 symbols. And it's interesting because you'll notice that this is carved in stone. There was a written version of it, of even the old hieroglyphics that would be written with pen and ink on, in this case, papyrus, or it could be on a parchment, which is a dried, scraped animal skin. These are some of the symbols. And I, the thing at the top is called a rebus. You know what a rebus is? A rebus is a series of symbols that when you put them all together, they create a message. Can you tell me what that says? I love you. I love you. You just read something that is exactly the equivalent of hieroglyphics. Because hieroglyphics is a combination of letters, letter symbols, and of um, the what's called a biliterals, which are like ka, sha, ka, you know, the two letters or more that go together to form one sound. But it also has symbols that are themselves uh, the, the, the thing that you're talking about. In other words, down here, you can see it. There's a symbol for house. There's a symbol for man, for woman, for God. So hieroglyphics is a combination of a phonetic language, which means the letters. In other words, each of these would be a letter like in our alphabet. But it's also those same symbols can be representative of the thing they look like. This is not only the letter for, it's the letter A, but the symbol also means eagle. And it's a combination of all that, both phonetic, the sounds of letters, and also um, a, an ID graphs. In other words, symbols that mean what they look like. These are all symbols of ka, which means spirit, uh, soul. All of these represent some concept, either a thing or an idea. Those would be combined with letters that, in effect, spelled words. Um, this is one of the things that was critical for the, the interpretation in the 1800s. I'm going to describe that at the end. How many of you all have been to the British Museum and seen the Rosetta Stone? The Rosetta Stone, that one piece of rock, is the thing that allowed uh, Western culture to reinterpret hieroglyphs. We could not read them until the late 1700s. But these are what's called a cartouche. A cartouche is a loop, and this is an example. This is the cartouche of the name of Thutmose uh, III. It is a loop with a, a line at one end. It represents a loop of rope that is tied at one end. These cartouches were used to represent the names of kings or pharaohs or queens, uh, people who were part of royalty. These various ones, uh, Khufu, some of the eight, some of the very old of the pharaohs. Uh, here we have Hatshepsut. This is this, this is her name. This was her symbol in hieroglyphics. Um, Thutmose the thir third, Thutmose the fourth, um, uh, Amenhotep the second, Ramses the second, Ramses the ninth, uh, etc. Once they realized that these cartouches, these loops or ovals that go around certain symbols that they represented names, that became the key to them beginning to figure out what these things said, what they represented. You will see a lot of these cartouches, these ovals. Every time you see one of those ovals with a line, sometimes they're put uh, sideways, by the way. Sometimes they're laying on their side and the line will be on one end. Whenever you see that, that is the name of some royal person. And you'll see a bunch of those because there are places in the Temple of Karnak, for instance, they'll have a wall that lists pharaohs, and there'll be dozens of these things. This is the next development after the hieroglyphics. As you can imagine, hieroglyphics were not easy to write. Let me do an outline of you know an owl so that you could tell it's an owl. It got very difficult. From hieroglyphics, proper hieroglyphics, they then developed various simplified versions of it that could be written. If you were carving in stone, you would do these detailed forms of hieroglyphics. A duck, a bug or scarab, a bee. 
Then they developed, in order to be able to simplify writing, they did a short form of hieroglyphic. Later on, they had what they called semi-hieroglyphics, both a more detailed version of that, and these are all the same things across this line. All of these things mean duck. A more detailed form and then a short form, and then they got to a modified version of hieroglyphics, which is called hieratic. Hieratic was much simpler to write, which meant if you were using a pen, you could do this. This is hieratic writing. It says the same thing as the hieroglyphs. In fact, the symbols are the same as the hieroglyphs, except they have been boiled down and made more simple. So this line right here is exactly the same as this, which would have been what they would have carved in a piece of stone. Now, imagine how long it would take to do a whole this much writing of those kind of symbols. But this, you can write very quickly. So hieratic was a simplified version that they could write with pen and ink on papyrus, on parchment, on that sort of thing. From hieratic, they continued to develop this. Um, actually, I was missing one. Hang on. Okay. At the bottom here, can you see this? Um, I forgot to mention. These are numbers, and you will see this a lot, too, on the walls, if you notice it. This little bar is a one. It actually looks like a one. The loop, uh, it looks like a... Uh, what would you call that? A, wicked, okay. a horseshoe. And I'm saying, oh, croquet. croquet. That's what I was trying to think of. A croquet hoop. That means 10. They used a base 10 system in Egypt. Remember, I told you they had a mathematical system. Um, if it's a swirl like this, it means 100. This sort of flag post is 1,000. A curved staff is 10,000. A what, what looks like a pointing down is 100,000. And 1 million is, which I think that's great, 1 million. Okay, um, so the number system as well, they had hieroglyphic symbols, and they would combine different ones of those. And all you have to do, it's sort of like Roman numerals, you go through and you sort of look at them and you add them up in your head, and that tells you what the number was. Okay, so hieratic, the various kind of simplified symbols. From hieratic, they then continued to develop a s other simplified versions of hieroglyphics, because hieratic still was fairly complicated in that it was both phonetic and it was the ideographs, these things that came together to form the symbols. Later on, they developed a more simplified version of uh, these letters in two forms. One was called demotic. Demotic was a simplified, boiled down kind of version of hieroglyphics. Then later, when there was a Greek influence, the Copts, which was the Christian community, uh, later on the Christian community, but the Coptic language that existed in Egypt, they developed Coptic writing. Coptic writing was a heavily Greek-influenced version of Demotic. So you went from hieroglyphics, very complicated, to a simplified version that you could write, which was hieratic, to a more simplified version, Demotic, but it was still a basic language. When the Greek influence, you ended up with Coptic. All of those languages were related. And that's very important to understand in terms of understanding the translation of this language because of this. This is the Rosetta Stone. We believe it was carved sometime around 196 BC, so it was at the start of the second century BC. And if you've ever seen this thing, the reason this was so important, when the Napoleonic troops conquered Egypt in the uh, 1700s, they found this stone. On the top of it, it has hieroglyphics. In the middle of it, it has the same text message written in Demotic. At the bottom, it is written in Greek. This is the first time they were ever able to look at hieroglyphics, or even at Demotic, which they knew a little bit more about, and translate them because they had the Greek version of the same message at the bottom. Well, when they discovered this thing, they took it back to France, and there was an Egyptologist in France at that time named Jean-Francois Campagnon. Jean-Francois Champagnon, uh, get dry up here, Champollion recognized, first thing he did was he recognized cartouches up here. And then he was able to link those cartouches, he didn't know what a cartouche was, with the fact that down here in Greek, because the rulers that were being talked about in the second century BC were the Ptolemaic rulers that had taken over after Alexander the Great. So they had Greek names. They were able to look at the Greek text and recognize, because they used phonetic spelling for the Ptolemaic rulers' names, 
and said, wait a minute, right there, that matches that. That must be the ruler's name. So they began to recognize the ruler's name and recognize that a cartouche was always used to surround a ruler's name. And from the symbols that were in those cartouches, they began to say, well, that, that symbol inside that cartouche appears over here. And based upon the phonetic spelling of the ruler's name in Greek, they were able to piece that out. And the, they were the first, the French scholars, particularly uh, Jean Collion, was the first one to be able to begin to translate this. They continued to work on this and work on this and work on this. And then a group of French scholars went back to Egypt and started making you know, exact drawings or tracings of some of the hieroglyphics. They continued to work on it until they were able to have almost all, there's still a few mysteries in there, but almost all of the hieroglyphics after that time were they were able to translate. But there was a period of almost 1,800 years when nobody could read this. And the Rosetta Stone is the thing that allowed them to do that, and the British have it now. Okay, I actually don't know the story of how it got from France to Britain, but it did. So you're going to see a ton of this tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, but when we visit Luxor. Look for the cartouches, look for the panels that have all of the symbols for the unity of the upper and lower, whether it be the various crowns, whether it be the tying together of the symbols, you know, the, um, the cobra, which is what's called the uraeus, the, the uh, upright cobra, the uraeus symbol with the vulture, when you see the B was the symbol for, I think it's the upper, upper Egypt as well. The B tied in with some other things, these various animal symbols, but especially the lotus, which is a blossom, looks like a tulip is in the symbolism, or what almost looks like a, a um, fleur de lis is the papyrus. When you see those two things next to one another, that is a symbol of the unification of Egypt into one country, the thing that's given them the longest history of any nation in the world. Okay, that's a real quick introduction. I was promised myself I was not going to go too long today. Any questions about any of that? Yes? The, uh, the workforce in Egypt over the years, was it predominantly farmers that during the off-season would kind of get enlisted to do all these public works, public works, or was it different slave base like the Romans? Or? So the question is, the labor that they had to create all this stuff, were they slaves, or were they recruited farmers, or whatever? That is, believe it or not, a politically charged question, if you're, at least if you're talking to an Egyptologist, which I'm not. Um, <laughs> the, there are some experts in Egypt who say that they did not use slave labor, that people were paid for their work, and that they contributed to these great projects because it was an act of especially worship. All of these things had spiritual significance to them. We're going to talk about the religious aspects tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon. But um, there is real controversy about that. Obviously, the Hebrew scriptures say that the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Well, that's one of the things that Egyptologists don't like because there's no specific Egyptian record about there being slaves involved. Uh, we do have places, the Ramesseum and other places where we know uh, in Luxor, and we'll drive by that, where there were living quarters for people who were working on these projects. The question as to whether they were there in, you know, in forced labor or whether they were there voluntarily or being paid. It's been proposed by some people that there may have been um, people would work shifts. In other words, they would, they would spend a period of time working on these great building projects because it took an enormous amount of labor and a long period of time to do these big projects. And they would spend time there for a while and then they would go back to their own agriculture, their own farms, their own needs. Uh, but it is true that the, the temple, as I say, the, the first, the old kingdom pretty much folded, most people believe, because they were given so much money to the building of these temples and of these, uh, the mortuary cults, so that they would be honored after death, actually worshipped after death, after they were no longer in the physical life, that they had given so much to that, they bankrupted themselves. And so there was an enormous amount of money going toward that, an enormous amount going to uh, the maintenance of these temples, the maintenance of the priestly orders, uh, well, the guides will tell you some about that, how much, like enormous numbers of, of cattle and grain and those sorts of things every day was given in support. And what they would do is they would offer it as a, a, an offering to the gods, and then the gods would very generously say, well, that's no thanks, you can have it. And they would take it back and the priests would have it. You know, they would eat the meat, they would eat the grain, they would drink the, you know, the libations that were given, 
And so that's how the priestly orders were supported, by what was given technically as an offering to the deities. Amun-Ra is the primary deity in Luxor. Um, the Aten was the primary god that was worshipped in Amarna. Various places within Egypt were the center of worship of various gods. And at one time or another, one or the other of them would gain preeminence. During the New Kingdom, what we're going to be looking at is when Amun was by far the, the biggest focus. Amun-Ra, the, you know, the, the connection of those two deities, and you'll see some examples of that. Uh, how those symbols came together, and we'll look at that a little bit tomorrow as well. Okay? Yes? Uh, well, you can see the writing on it. It's it's a fairly large piece of stone, if I remember correctly. I mean, we've seen it. It's it's like this, you know, so that the writing would be fairly typical size of writing that you would do, hieroglyphics, demotic, and uh, Greek. Okay? And I tell you, British Museum, half of the stuff they sell in their gift shop has this image on it. I mean, they know that this is a huge draw for them. And once again, you know, Egypt um, is asking for their stuff back, just like Greece is. And, and the British keep going, doo, 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 because this, this is, for a long time they said, well, we can take care of it and you can't. That's not really true in either case anymore, but the British are not returning the stuff. Other questions? Again, we'll get into more detail tomorrow about the religion and about the sites we're going to see, so we'll pick all of that up tomorrow afternoon. Anything else? Thank you very much.